How much do you reckon, Mac? A couple yards of Mabel? Mm, yeah. No, I'll make it three. All right, everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Modern Times Podcast. Uh, as always, we Hi, have Anne. Anne. Hi. And Sarah, back Hello. with us again. And uh, we just got finished interviewing with uh, somebody very special and with a direct connection to Chaplin's early days. It is Stephen Normand, a great grandnephew of Mabel Normand. And we just finished up the interview with him, and I thought it went really well. Uh, we learned a lot of things about Mabel. I think it went very well. I loved hearing a perspective from her distant ancestor, her relative. So it was an interesting perspective that we haven't had before. And he's really a passionate person in, in regards to his Aunt Mabel. He's wanting the real story behind Mabel uh, to come out and not just the, uh, the scandals. Yes. Well, uh, we'll get into that interview in just one second. But first... We do have an audio clip that was sent to us by uh, Karis Gray regarding the gold rush, which seems like it was a million years ago we recorded like that episode. And, you know, something regarding our gold rush episode that we really forgot to talk about was um, Max Swain. We really didn't talk about him all that much. You know, we'll have to do an episode devoted to him because he's definitely an important part of, of uh, the gold rush and connections to Chaplin's early days. I listened mm -hmm. back to that show and I realized we barely talked about him at all. So Max Wayne, that was really the last film that he was in with Char Charlie, wasn't it? Right, right. But Although he, he worked until 1935 uh, when he passed away. And actually one of his last films was released after he passed away. Yeah, there's just so much, you know, when you get on, especially when we're talking about one of Chaplin's biggest, most, you know, popular movies. There's just so much to talk about. It's easy to lose track of uh, certain things until you listen back later and realize it. Right. Mm -hmm. Hello, this is Karis Gray, and this is my three minutes of getting acquainted with Charles Chaplin's 1925 feature film, The Gold Rush. Hopefully I won't find myself alone in finding Charlie Chaplin's Gold Rush, perhaps one of the harder of his films to watch, as... It really has this sense of darkness about it that the other films lack. Uh, the Little Tramp is really out of his comfort zone in this film and you can't help but wonder if the harsh cold and sense of danger is Chaplin's way of getting across some deeper emotional state. Uh, Charles was using this depiction of frozen wasteland in such contrast to his home in sunny California and indeed the canvas for so many of his Little Tramp movies that this film really does have something very harsh about it, something very different and this is why it's such a fascination to watch The Gold Rush and even though it's a film that isn't as much a light relief as his other work. It has to be described as one of his highest and greatest achievements in filmmaking. And he's certainly brought the medium and his own character exploration to an entirely new level here. The Tramp really needed nine lives for this film and it he really fights to live long enough to steal that famous kiss from Miss Georgia Hale. This famous ending is cut by Chaplin in the release. Something, well, an action made even more intriguing by his line in the commentary of the re-release of And what a happy ending. What a happy ending that was. And the film then promptly fades out before they reach the upper deck for the famous photo scene. The audience are offered their chance here to then visualise their own ending, but for anyone who has seen the original version with the original ending, it does make you sigh as it seems Charlie once again attempts to airbrush his own story, his own history, something that he's done many times in especially his first autobiography. Uh, where he retells his beginnings in London and his childhood in an almost Dickensian manner 
which is so filled with ridiculousness that it's at times like this you can almost be angry at Chaplin. As though a man who looked so often for logic and truth in his films, he betrays this many times, both in written work and in his movies, when things get a little bit too close to his own true emotion. He doesn't seem to want to dwell on moments of truth and emotion. He has a confidence only in the carefully controlled pathos and peril that is within the lines of safety. When he crosses this line, he is vulnerable, and that is unacceptable to Chaplin. On watching The Gold Rush, I recall reading of Charlie's distaste for this time of year. Uh, the film is set around Christmas and New Year's and indeed there are many who find Christmas and New Year a time of great isolation and I wonder if this is the foundation of this film as Charlie watches in from the window and Old Lang Syne rings out with the melancholy twinkling of a piano, you suddenly feel lonely and as chilled as the tramp. This is for all humanity shut out in the cold or unable to find joy and redemption in the same conventions as others because you are the stranger, the orphan, the misfit, abandoned or heartbroken chorus line of the world's festive cheer. It's clear that in this film, Charlie does feel isolated and is trying to convey through the tramp his own confusion at his feelings of loneliness and isolation. Charlie is on an expedition within himself, always, in his filmmaking and seemingly in his personal life, which sp always spills over into his characterisation of the tramp. But again, always at a safe enough distance, he almost caricatures himself. Anyone who is a Chaplin fan or has read into the background of his life will find that this is one of the most delightful qualities of the Chaplin films, is that foundation of truth, that Chaplin is talking about things that he knows of and he understands, even if it is in a very roundabout way. On watching The Gold Rush, you are reminded of the story of his mother. Yeah, once again, as with many of his heroines, in Georgia Hale, a feeling of trying to resurrect his, mo his mother's past life more than something within himself, as though he's putting himself in the setting in order to try and understand something but always feels slightly on the outside of what's going on. The Gold Rush is indeed a harder film for me to watch, and perhaps as the credits roll, I don't feel particularly cheered. I think The Gold Rush can be described as one of the real forerunners to, to modern, modern film. There's a quality that's hugely sophisticated and lacks the cute, novel, cartoonish feeling of some of Chaplin's prior movies. The Gold Rush is a film to be taken very seriously and deservedly remembered as one of not just Chaplin's greatest films, but one of the greatest films of filmmaking history. All right, thank you, Kara, so much for that. That was a fantastic little review. And uh, now we're just going to jump right into the Stephen Norman interview because it's really in-depth and it's it's a little long, but you know what? We learned a lot from it, and it's a very enjoyable listen. So we hope you enjoy. We'd like to welcome to the show someone with a very special connection to someone from Chaplin's early days. Kind of hinted at it on our Facebook page, but we didn't tell exactly who it would be. Please welcome to the show Stephen Normand. Hello, everyone. <laughs> uh, so how are you doing, Stephen? I'm doing... Uh quite well. I've been very busy with um, a production of Mac and Mabel here, which is at Chichester Festival Theatre, so that's um, basically taken over my uh, my time, doing a lot of that up and down, uh, because I live in London. It's very, very good production, and uh, I'm supporting it 100%. It's actually, I think, the definitive Mac and Mabel this time. And yeah, that's something I wanted to get into a little bit later, a couple of questions I wanted to ask you about Mac and Mabel and the way Mabel has been portrayed in films and uh, by other actresses and things. But we'll get to that in a second. 
basically what I wanted to start off as was I wanted to find out how you discovered uh, Mabel and how you discovered who your great aunt was. Kind of the learning process that mm. came in discovering. Okay, well, was a little as a little boy, I was brought up in my grandmother's home, and she was the sister-in-law of Mabel Normand. And when uh, she, my grandfather passed away, obviously she had all of the artifacts and things that belonged to Mabel. But in the house, particularly um, on the staircase going upstairs, there was a huge big painting of Mabel, which possibly you may have seen on my um, on my uh, Facebook page occasionally, of her dressed in a Mickey, and it was a life-size uh, painting. And um, I was asking my grandmother, I remember I was about six or seven, something like that, asking who was this lady dressed in these funny clothes and why is she up on the wall? And that was my first recollection. And then after that, uh, or during that, from that time on, my grandmother would tell me different things about her and stories. And as I got a bit older, she let me go into the attic and pull out costumes and things like that that had belonged to me. I wanted to be putting on these hats. And this actually was a hat from um, the Extra Girl with little cherries on it, yeah. uh, which was velvet. And I liked that. Um, but I, there were things that were, you know, that she had actually worn. And I, I was so um, taken <coughs> back. I remember, um, you know, she was quite little as well. Uh, uh, quite small, so the clothes, um, you know, when I'd hold them up to me, nearly fit. Anyway, I sound like, <laughs> believe me, it's never gone any further than that. But that <laughs> the beginning, um, <laughs> of of, of uh, seeing all Mabel's things, and then gradually, as I was growing up, um, my grandmother would speak to me uh, when I asked questions. But there was always one um, bit of sadness because my grandfather, who was Mabel's brother. Um, found all the pressure and stress of all that Mabel went through he took it personally because they've been quite close and he did commit suicide and so for my grandmother that was quite a difficult thing um, but it was only after my grandmother passed away that I was able to get hold of all of the things that she had had which she passed on to me and then I discovered uh, a lot more about my great aunt Mabel um, and then I as a matter of fact, I must say that during the time when I was learning about her through my grandma, and she wouldn't tell me things, I used to go to the library and look up Aunt Mabel in books about movies in the background, uh, in the uh, index, glossary. And uh, I learned things there, and I read that she'd been involved in some scandals and drugs and all this other sort of stuff. And when I'd asked my grandmother, she didn't want to talk about it, and... Uh, she said, well, maybe Aunt Gladys will talk to you. And Aunt Gladys was Mabel's sister who lived in New York. And uh, I did really didn't meet her until I was about 12. And she had lived out in California with Mabel at some point in the early days. And um, she told me an awful lot about her. Actually, Mabel influenced her to get a, a flying license. And she told me about my grandfather having come out to California after the war um, and he uh, she got my grandfather involved in a uh, camera had to had to operate a camera and be a cameraman so he did that for a while and so I was learning more and more things through Gladys who actually you know knew her and you know I, I was infatuated with her because she looked a bit like Aunt Mabel um, but she was a bit more I think on the tougher side <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, but um she got involved with Mabel, and then she met other people and and, and uh, got into her own life. And then uh, occasionally we'd visit Mabel while Mabel was, you know, still active. And as I say, going back to what I was doing, looking up Mabel, I started writing to these people out in California. To, I, I was trying to find their addresses and would write to television stations or write to the books where I read the uh, the um, publishers and try to get the address and they would forward the letters on and of course in those days there was no communication like we have now with this um, um, you know internet and everything so you'd write a letter and everything I wrote was by hand and I was only about 12 or 13 and you know putting it together and I, I guess they received these letters and thought oh this kid is too much but uh, amazingly I received back a lot of uh, you know return uh, information and even invitations um, to come out uh, someday when I was able to to Hollywood and, and meet some of them uh, but I uh, obviously as I was growing up then I had other things that came in between but I always was interested in Mabel and kept collecting things about her 
and then, uh, it, by the way, am I going to? to no, you're okay. Oh, Keep okay. Going. Tell me to be quiet if I, <laughs> I need to. <laughs> uh, uh, but the, the next part of it was uh, my army business. Then I had more time, and I decided to go to university. And then whilst I was at university, I had a letter come from Michael Stewart, who is the man that wrote Hello, Dolly, and Barnum, oh. asking me if I would be able to help him with any information about Mabel Normand. Um, and so I said, well, yes. And he said, well, we're thinking of a play. We'd like to do a musical play about her life. But what year was that? Well, that was in uh, 70, going into 72. But one little thing I have forgotten to tell you, in 1971, I think it was 71, uh, it, it was uh, Debbie Reynolds was in a play in New York called, um, oh, called it. I can't think what it, it'll come, uh, not Jeanette, but Annette, but something about, um, I can't think of the play that she was in, but I went to see her. She wrote, wrote me a letter asking, would I have any costumes or anything I could lend her for a museum she wanted to start out in Hollywood uh, uh, with costumes from the different actors and actresses. Oh my. Uh, and so I said. She's got a big collection of you know, Hollywood she, memorabilia. Yeah. Yes, well, I I went to see her backstage and we had a chat and showed her some of the things that I had and she was very interested. And whilst we were talking about those things, um, it was Irene, by the way, that was the play she was in. It was a musical. Um, she uh, said to me that there's a, she said, I have a friend, his name is Gower Champion, and he's told me that they're thinking of doing something about your Aunt Mabel. It's all talk at the moment. So she said, uh, but when it comes around, I'll give you a name to the people that are the creative people. And then uh, yeah, you'll, you'll hear about it. Well, hence, another year, 18 months later, the letter came from Michael Stewart. And that was the beginning of a wonderful friendship with him. Mm. And also the beginning of Mac and Mabel. Um, of course, I wasn't happy um, with... It was actually quite blatant with, with the scenes of her shooting up with uh, needles and things initially. Ah. Uh, and also taking what they call the angel dust with William Desmond Taylor, who wasn't called that in the play at that time. He is now called William Desmond Taylor. Um, but um, That's something I was going to ask you, actually, um, since you brought it up. Yes. I saw Mac and Mabel. They did a production of it in Florida uh, in January. And I had never seen it up until that time. And what I found interesting was I really enjoyed it. I, I, I enjoyed the songs, but there's a lot of uh, factual uh, things that aren't necessarily 100% <clears throat> accurate. And a lot of things are kind of jumbled as far as things that happened in reality versus how they're based for a play, which I understand. You know, the Robert Downey Jr. Chaplin movie is the same situation. But I don't think to that extreme, though. In the Chaplin movie, yeah. they kind of... I mean, they took creative license, but kind of moves at a certain pace. But I think with the Smack and Mabel, some of it was just like, you know, never really happened. Uh, well, I mean, some of the things did happen, but not in the sequence which they showed. Um, I mean, Mabel obviously wasn't a hash slinger in a restaurant or anything like that. But, but if you think about it, she was an artist model. It would have been very interesting for an artist model to be how you're going to introduce her into a play and make it you know, um, funny or exciting. Um, if she, you know, went out to, um, um, say, um, in, uh, audition for a part at Max Senate studio, it was actually funnier. I think probably, I mean, this is what they thought, mm -hmm. uh, to have this person come in, you know, with a bring lunch and giving my uh, nickel back and all that kind of thing. Uh, it definitely was artistic license. And when I would raise points about it, um, they did listen and as a matter of fact, Michael took out what they have now put back in in this production right. about yeah. actually saying she was a heroin addict. Mm. Uh, I don't want to lose track of what you've just brought up. So could you bring me back to where we're? Oh, sure. You want me to? Yeah. Sure. I just basically wanted to ask you if there's any, if there was anything that you when you saw the show. Well, I mean, you kind of mm -hmm. answered that question already. But if when you saw the show, you you didn't think that was that needed to be adjusted or or something mm -hmm. that. Uh, you didn't necessarily agree with how they they switched her story, but mm -hmm. um, as you said, you know they changed some things to make it a little bit more exciting. Mm -hmm. I, I really think what they've <laughs> done now is they've made it more of a. You see, when the show actually was was 
was was thought of. Um, it, it was supposed to, as they say, Mac and Mabel, but it became a Mabel and Mac, actually, because she's really the principal character. Mm-hmm. Um, Mac, and she just, you know, all the songs are named, um, you know, Mabel, what, when Mabel comes in the room, look what happened to Mabel, and uh, the rest, a good number of them. And so um, I must say that the play for me was was exciting, and I put it uh, in the positive um, category because it was actually the first thing that ever brought Mabel to the public eye after 30, at that time, 40 years. Um, and, and that's people, always a good thing. Yes, when I mean, Michael Stewart said to me, and he wrote this in a letter to me, saying, um, if there's any, I know about theater, he said, but I know nothing about Hollywood, but it would be, it would give me great happiness to know that I've been able to bring the name of Mabel Norman to the front again and for her to be remembered for her great contribution to motion pictures through this play. So, um, again, in the play, she's portrayed at time, at, at one point as a, you know, kind of a Mac has to count one, two, three, you turn and all this business, which is still in it. Um, but now, is, uh, I don't find that offensive. You know. Yeah, sorry. Uh, is he going? Uh, is is he going by any of Max Sennett's biography? Because mm -hmm. I know oh. Max Sennett tended to really put more of an emphasis on himself, even when he's talking about Charlie Chaplin. You know, and yeah, he seemed I'm, to embellish, like and stretch the truth. Really. Right. So I'm yeah. wondering if, if um, he took anything from uh, Max Sennett's biography and included it into the play. Oh, definitely. I mean, that, that Mac's book, um, I actually met the man that did the editing of his book when I went to California. And Mac was remembering what he wanted to remember, and he remembered it with, with uh, rose-colored glasses. Um, right. And actually, he he spoke to my, my, we were supposed to go out to California and visit him, just to visit. And it was going to be my first visit to meet with him, because he called himself Uncle Mac on the telephone. <laughs> and sadly, he, he was 80 years old at, the point, at that point, and he became unwell and he, he passed away before we were able to come out but wow uh, they really did love each other the problem was Mac took advantage of Mabel financially and he was always too embarrassed to admit that and he knew what he did to her uh, meaning the film Mickey which uh, yeah, she, because she that was made. released go ahead yes yes that Mickey was released quite a few, uh, a couple of years after she made it, correct? Yes, it was released in 1918. Mac, yes, Mac told her when they viewed the film, he said to her, Mabel, because you know she made it in her own film company, which he helped right. her to set up, but it was her name, Mabel Norman Feature Films. And anyway, uh, and she directed it, part of it with Richard Jones, but um, he told her the film wasn't any good and it wouldn't wouldn't it and he offered her twenty five thousand dollars to uh, purchase the film from her and he said he would shelve it um, and uh, what he did was he he knew the film was good and he consulted with the other investors and so they gave Mabel the twenty five thousand her believing what he told her mm -hmm. and uh, he he cheated her actually because the film was released a year later and it was one of the first to make a million dollars. Mm. So she, that was the beginning of the end with the two of them, I think. Um, well, definitely on her point of view, because she couldn't trust him, she found, um, you know, after what he did to her. He, I'm afraid the man thought a lot of money, and money overruled everything else, and, and success. He was quite a selfish man. But because but his biography, of that... He, sorry. Because mm -hmm. of, of him being that way with money, while he um, found really great people, he wasn't able to keep them. You know, when when it came to negotiating contracts and stuff, because he was so cheap. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Actually, um, Mabel was smarter than him in in the sense of being witty and 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 being able. You know, she got his number, so to speak. But uh, she had never had so much um, money put, you know, before her before in her life, and so she had no way of handling. Didn't have an idea how to handle it, and and he was uh, the person she trusted. And like you say, the others uh, picked up on his um, incompetence in that sense. I mean, he, he did go broke later on. He, um, he was finished very early. Mm -hmm. But well, Charlie Chaplin. Lost, well, yeah, I was going to just say that. Chaplin left after a year. Uh, can you imagine the mistake Senate realized 
uh, probably immediately um, mm-hmm. at what he had lost there. And Ford Sterling, you know, left. He eventually came back, but it seemed like everybody who worked for Roscoe Arbuckle, yeah. um, Harold mm-hmm. Lloyd, did he work mm-hmm. for Keystone? I think at one point Harold he Lloyd. I no. He was afterward. But no, he may have, I, I, but he wasn't there in the time of Mabel. Yeah. Oh right, correct, correct. Also in that area, she mm. was a neighbor of William Desmond. She was dating Cortland Dines, uh, mm-hmm. purportedly. She was there, you know, when he was shot. But mm. people tended to not even think about that, and they just focused on Mabel. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Because the way people thought about Edna Provine, like, oh, you know, there's no scandal, but she was there. It's but all about just, a screen persona, because. And the Bryant's always played a very sweet character in Chaplin's films, while Mabel, even though she's kind of more of the rowdy one, it, that was her persona in the film, so kind of rowdy, but very fun-loving at the same time, and she could take a beating at, as well. She, instead of just being like a pretty face, she right, had right. personality on screen. A couple of things about Mabel that I always uh, am interested in, it was the fact that not only did she sort of help Charlie develop in front of the camera, um, mm-hmm. he had a hard time becoming comfortable in front of the camera, and Mabel certainly helped him adapt. And if you watch, you know, if you watch the early Mabel films, you can tell that Charlie borrowed some of the things uh, from Mabel that, that ended up making him so endearing, the close-up. And you can also argue that because Mabel was directing films of her own, that that could have inspired Chaplin to do the same as well. Certainly. Yeah, I, I think they fed into one another. Actually, they were a very good match. But, um, you know, I, as she'd been making films before he had been making films, she had a bit more practice, I think. And then her personality at that point, she was able to let go and give, where he was still discovering what his gifts were. Um, and then once he realized what they were, then he obviously, um, you know, uh, cashed in on them. But he d- he did give her credit for, um, you know, her, her talent and things. But I think, like many men of the period, uh, you you know, women just don't tell men what to do or to influence oh, yeah, them. Right. It's almost Absolutely. Almost unheard of, you know. Um, and he was probably a bit maybe jealous of her. But I, I have to say, too, they did remain friends. I mean, people don't talk about right. this, but... Um, they did remain friends, and he was concerned about her even until she passed away. And he was my great grandmother made him uh, or asked him, and he was he did accept to be an honorary pallbearer at her funeral. So there was that wow connection still. One of the most poignant things that you know was kind of discovered. This author Lillian Ross ha- had uh, gone to the Chaplin estate, and he, uh, she'd taken pictures of the family and. Um, the book came out in 1980 called Memories Memories with Charlie. But anyway, there's a picture of Charlie holding his daughter Josephine. And he had said that she reminded him of Mabel. And he was talking to people and he was like, um, remember Mabel? And somebody said, yeah, you know, f- f- from the Keystones. And, yes. uh, you know, he said, you know, sweet Mabel. And he just kind of, you know, looked wistful about it. Yeah. I mean, he really did think warmly of her. And yes, he gave I, her that in, in his autobiography. Yes, absolutely. And that's why I was cross with Miss, with Lord Attenborough, because he took out of context even, you know, not quoting Chaplin himself correctly. But, I mean, uh, the Chaplin, because he outlived Mabel, you know, Mabel died in 1930, and that was it. And the fam- our family were very ignorant of rights and what you should do, you know, and, and weren't very shrewd. But right. uh, Chaplin himself... Um, lived much longer and was able to control his uh, rights to his films and all this and, and they have their I mean I think they own the rights to everything with 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 him in they have, it they own everything after 1918 oh, um, okay. before that he was going through the same thing a lot of people were you know getting taken advantage of and so after 1918 and of course they own the image uh, of the tramp so you can't sell something with yeah. that image but it took him, it took him a, a few years to figure that out, but um, after 1918, then he started owning all of his own films. Yes, well, I mean, he he and Mary Pickford were very clever. I mean, Mary Pickford, I met and and chatted with her, and um, 
she was another one who was a they never made films together but she was a great friend and very very good to Mabel as were the Tomlidge sisters um, but but with Charlie uh, you know he, he just was able to have a long life and and he was clever himself uh, you know he learned things as he went along and he was I mean he's a great great man and uh, probably one of the number one pioneers of, of comedy and film um, but Unfortunately, when you pass away and you're forgotten, other people um, kind of remember what they think about you. And also, you just fade into the sunshine, into the sunlight, as they say. But um, unfortunately Stephen, for Mabel, she, yes, sorry. Just going back um, a little bit, um, I've been following you on Tumblr and, and reading uh, different things from the Mabel Norman official uh, blog and what have you. And... I know, reading it, how passionate you are about your aunt, and I know you took particular offense to um, that singer Stevie Nicks, uh, the the song that she sang. And in that song, she inferred that uh, Mabel was um, a cocaine addict. And mm -hmm. I know how upset you were about that. Did you ever get a chance to talk to her or anybody close to the yeah. music publisher? Well... Um, I heard, I didn't hear from her personally, but I did make a complaint, not a complaint, well, I, I spoke out uh, definitely, and she knows that I've done that. Um, and there, there is some organization which she's, who represents her, who did, uh, you know, uh, sort of try to undo it. But really, the point is, is this woman has, you know, taken the, just has taken the name. Once you take a name of someone who really lived, who is a person... Mm -hmm personality um, and then make these accusations and making money off what I was really angry about is that she's using my aunt's name and making money off of her name and in bad taste she associates herself with Mabel being this uh, hophead and uh, you know Miss Nix maybe had this experience she says in her, her own writing that she right. uh, her, her nostrils were nearly um, you know ruined Correct. Uh, yes. from sniffing cocaine okay. uh, so you know, I, I don't, I, these people are going to say these things and do these things, but I think it's not right when they're, you know, making money off a dead person and also saying things that are not true. Um, and as I challenged her, you show me where it's documented that she took cocaine or that she was into heroin and that you can base your lyrics on that experience, uh, then I'll, I'll accept that. But she hasn't been able to, to this, to this time. Well, I uh, I don't want this to get too heavy-handed. You know, obviously there's a lot of things like that we could talk about, but uh, I love focusing on the positive aspects of of Mabel's career. And uh, there are a couple things that I noticed. You know, when when people talk about female comedy, the first female comedian, what's the first thing they always want to talk about? Lucy. <laughs> they always want to talk about Lucy and how Lucy was the pioneering comedian. Uh, you know, for women, and I'm always uh, wanting to bring up Mabel, and when I bring that up, a lot of people don't seem to know anything about her, and she well, was doing it so earlier, and you know, she was the first one to get tied to the railroad tracks, which is, a, to me, a silent film stereotype, you know, yeah. a, as of now, and there are so many things that she did first as a woman, uh, mm -hmm. directing, too, yeah. yeah, and it just seems like when anybody wants to talk about the pioneering women of comedy, it always starts with Lucy. And I'm like, you, there were people doing things way earlier than that. But Nigel, as as we've said, you know, time and time again, Hollywood seems to have forgotten the 30 years or 40 years before 1930. They don't mm -hmm. acknowledge the silent error. And you're right. Um, a lot of women made great inroads in that time period and... There, then after the talkies came, they were kind of put back in their place. But anyway, there were I, a lot of screenwriters in the silent era that were women, and they were just shuffled off once talkies came along. Correct. Right. I think when you, when we say Lucy, I mean um, first of all, Lucy in most of her films that she made prior to television, she wasn't really known as a great comedian. She did um, right. sort of, you know. Um, wisecracks and that sort of thing, but uh, and Bob Hope got her along the way. But it, it was television that made Lucy a household name. And she, if you look at any of her, most of her antics, uh, 
you could play a Mabel Norman film right next to them and see the same thing being done. Of but television reached millions and millions of people. And, you know, Ch Lucy's a great person. I, I admire her and what she ha has given, but she did take it from other places. And sometimes she wasn't always so, um, you know, uh, giving credit where credit was due. May I just say, though, her daughter, uh, Desi, uh, not Desi, Lucy, uh, Lucy, Lucy Jr., played, yeah. uh, played Mabel in Mac and Mabel in a Florida production no a number of years ago. I didn't know that. That's amazing. Yes. Well, I have a letter from her where she <laughs> had written um, asking me to know more about Mabel, and then I wrote back and I, I didn't hear any more from her. As a matter of fact, I wrote to her mother and I never heard anything from her. But I'll tell you who I did hear from is Carol Burnett. Wow. Because one one program she did, she uh, they, you know, she used to have that question and answer thing at the end of the right. show, yes. mm -hmm. or at the beginning. They used to ask her questions, and she right. said, "Who is your influence on your comedy?" And she said, "Well, you may not have ever heard of her, but she was a woman called Mabel Norman who was in silent films with, and again with Charlie Chaplin. But I always say Chaplin was in films with Mabel Norman. Mm -hmm. Anyway, <laughs> but it was Carol Burnett that that gave her gave her her credit, and also when I wrote to Carol Burnett." She wrote me a lovely letter back, and when I tried to get Mabel a posthumous uh, Academy Award for her contribution, she, as a voting member, recommended uh, Mabel or nominated Mabel. But at that time, this was in the 70s, uh, they didn't award posthumous um, you know, Academy Awards. Because as you know, Max Sennett received one uh, in right. just prior to his death. Anyway, it's Carolina that's... Yeah. Carol Burnett is her standard back and a very, very nice lady, and she gave credit where credit is due. That's awesome. Let's uh, wind back the clock for a second. Um, let's just assume that somebody listening to this doesn't really know all that much about Mabel Normand. Um, mm -hmm. Let's just go back a little bit and kind of get her, her backstory, where she Bye. was born, how she kind of got into films and got associated with Senate. Because, you know, she was a, a model and, uh, uh, what was it, a Gibson girl. And then she ended she up with She was born Senate. in New York. Yes. Staten Island. <laughs> Have to give Staten Island its due. You know, she's one of their first uh, great um, contributions to Hollywood. She did. Uh, initially, she started out working at a firm called Butterix in Lower Manhattan, which was a place where they did women's uh, clothing patterns, where they cut out patterns for ladies' dresses. And mm -hmm. this, I think they're still in business today. But yeah. that's what she started in a, uh, in a sweatshop um, with, um, you know, uh, cutting out these, these, these uh, designs. And in, whilst doing that, uh, she was chosen to be one of their models for the you know to sell the the product on the on the um, on the oh, uh, package excuse me steven S yes just real quick um could you verify mabel's actual birth year because i've heard 1892 94 95 mm -hmm. she was born on november the 10th 1892 mm. oh okay okay because yeah. I, i've actually I mean, heard november 9th too but okay thanks the, the trouble is when I mean, I don't know if you want to know Mabel's saga when she was born, but she was born at home and she was born prematurely and uh, her mother had her and almost lost her. Um, and she was born with a, something called a call, C-A-U-L, on her face, which right. they used to uh, take and sell to sailors for good luck. Um, but, but because of Mabel and her mother being so ill at her birth, um, it wasn't registered as it as it should have been and she was baptized at home they called a priest to come um mm -hmm. because it didn't she was going to live so the problem um was that when they finally did record mabel's birth it was there was confusion and um there were two two dates given the, the 95 date and the 92 and most people will go by the 95 because there was a an um a census in that at that time mm -hmm. and there's an approximation that 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 was the date but according to Aunt Gladys Mabel's sister it was 1892 and everyone wanted okay. to be younger of course in Hollywood everybody uh, wanted to be younger than than they were so yeah, they, well, I don't think Mabel was would have at that point being only even if you give her the extra years to her uh, age she would only have been 38 when she passed away it was quite still quite young but um maybe as she, if she had lived longer she yes she would have brought her date because actually on her her, her uh, monument you know where she's 
her crypt in Hollywood, it does say 1895. And that was because her oh, mother wow. used the date. Oh, okay. Yeah. Where is she buried again? She's out in a um, called um, uh, Calvary uh, Mausoleum. It is a cemetery. It's a Roman Catholic cemetery, and she was her crypt is one of the first that were opened there. And actually, the Barrymores are buried right next to her in their. Oh crypt. wow. wow. Um, yeah, she's got company of them, um, and uh, uh, that—that's where you, you know, she's there. You can find her, and her mother, my great grandmother, is buried uh, uh, just below her. Uh, uh, when I say buried, I mean entombed in in, mm -hmm. in the crypt. But it also has Mabel Normand Cody dash Cody. Uh, oh, okay. Matter, would you be interested in hearing the story about her uh, marriage to Lou Cody at some point? Yeah, yeah that's Love interesting. To. Yeah. Okay, well, a lot of people will, a number of people, I think, on the Internet and uh, other places always make a big issue about her having been married to Lou Cody. And obviously, as the story goes, everyone knows it was a farce thing and that they right. didn't actually live together. But they were friends, and that's true. And he was an alcoholic, and Mabel was an alcoholic by that time. Um, and shortly after they were married, then she came down very seriously with uh, the tuberculosis and went into hospitals and whatever. Um, but they were married by a justice of the peace, which makes it legal. Um, and they, with all her troubles that she had, plus illness and, the, and Lou Cody himself being ill, they didn't want to go through a divorce, which would really would have screwed things, messed things up. So when, when Mabel died, and the point is too, they, uh, it's been said, and it's accepted that their marriage wasn't consummated, so they were living in different places. And it was certainly not because of love that they got married. Um, but um, when she died, as a Roman Catholic, you have to be buried in consecrated ground. Now, Correct. Right. Also, you would not, if you had been married to someone outside of the church and by a justice of the peace, you would not be allowed to be buried. So, so the Catholic Church didn't uh, accept that marriage, right? Is that why she was able to be buried well, the, in the... That's right. The bishop gave dispensation, but oh, okay. because it's legal, because of her, she was legally married, they had to put Cody, and that's why it, it says Mabel oh, Norman okay. right. dash Cody. But eventually, I'm going to have that Cody taken off of there. Mm. Mm. Yeah, the Catholic Church is real strict about certain things. Um, yes. Being buried in a, I'm Catholic, so I can't understand how. Well, I don't understand, but I know that's how they operate. <laughs> well, in 1930, they would never have allowed her to be buried in a Catholic, and she had a mass as well. So, I mean, if okay. uh, you know, the worst thing you can do is, I mean, um, is it be a divorcee or or be married? Oh yeah, the and they you would were excommunicated. never excommunicated. Yes, but that that's just a little thing about Mabel because she was actually quite a religious person, um, and she that was really what got her through all of her problems. I have her rosary beads still, which um, were you know her own that um, Pope Leo gave her when she went to Europe on a on a holiday. Um, I but wish she Mabel would have written biography. I'm, I'm sorry. I said I really wish Mabel would have written an autobiography. To give like her side mm. of everything. Yeah, what her experiences were like. Right. The trouble is, I mean, there are magazine articles at the time of her life, but no one dare say that she was a drug addict or she was on heroin. I mean, if you know, you can look even on the the proof or allegation that she was on drugs. I mean, people said this. What Mabel was on and what Mabel was doing, and I don't, it don't deny it. Really. She was drinking very heavily, gin. Well, also too, it's not mentioned very often but Edna Provines had a had a problem with with, uh, with alcohol but again mm. it's kind of weird like I was saying earlier it depends on your screen persona because mm -hmm. Edna Provines I love Edna but she was no angel you know but it's just that she wasn't thought like that even though she was kind of doing the same thing mm -hmm. yeah. Stephen what are your favorite uh, what are your favorite Mabel films well, my most favorite Mabel film is The Extra Girl because mm -hmm. it was made made at the very end and um, she there's different points in the film where she looks like she's not well and there's also toward the end they, they did some very nice uh, photography uh, of her um, and she looks 
really you wish that it could have ended her life could have ended as, as it did in that film with the little boy the little child and her being married and everything um but her antics in that are, I, I love her on the buckboard you know driving the the the, uh, the horses very fast as they race to the train uh, so that would be my her later later film that i really enjoyed i love mickey though um it, it's a bit broken here and there um in the sense that some the connecting of it is a bit difficult, but she's. I thought she was very, very good in, in Mickey, and I like Tilly's Punctured Romance, mm-hmm. which is a. a, film. a her and sorry? Charlie. St- her and Charlie stole that movie out from under Marie Dressler. I think yeah. she was making she was making twenty five hundred dollars a week making that film, and Charlie and Mabel were in contract with Keystone, so I don't know. Charlie was making one fifty. I'm assuming Mabel had to be making that or more, but still, that's not 2500 a week. No, and again, that's an example of Max Sennett being so clever and cheap uh, right. with the people that were important. But he, I mean, again, uh, she was a bit, Marie Dressel was a very big stage actress and well known um, on stage, and she did do very well on in films and Mabel and her she was really really kind to Mabel um, when Mabel wasn't well and you know sending flowers and cards and notes and things so I, I, Marie Dress was a, was a really lovely lady but you're absolutely right but um, may I just go back to the another film that I love that she made it's called Dash Through the Clouds and in this film Mabel actually flies in an airplane she's one of the first women to have flown in an airplane but she's not just sitting there you know in the seat looking comfortable she's actually got two pistols and the biplane is up in the air and she's uh, shooting these pistols at the bandits down below and it's an extraordinary film if you think it was made about 1911 or something like that i'm not quite sure of the date but i watched that film one. yesterday uh, did you really i did oh, okay. i did um the new uh, max senate collection that came out by flicker alley really really uh, nice set and uh, I was going to say, I hope they put out a Mabel set at some point with all her features and, and uh, a nice overview of her career. Um, I was going to say something when you brought up Tilly's punctured romance. Charlie and Mabel seem so modern compared to Ford Sterling and Marie Dressler and all the Ben Turpin, all those early, early film uh, actors. You watch... Mabel and Charlie, and they seem very, very much like you could drop them into 2015 and they would still work. Versus a lot of the other stars that have really, really, their their acting really looks dated by comparison. Yes, yeah, so I think, again, their talents worked off one another and, and, and they both, I mean, I think Marie Dressel probably, in a sense, wasn't trying to be creative. She was rather just reading a lot lines and whatever they were or you know following directions with the other two they were the brains of the outfit um i think you know and of course mac was quite clever obviously with his uh, he was very very good with comedy but but i think you're absolutely right um you can see the progression um you know of their artistry is and he was shortly after would that was when he was his media struck you know and he was on the way to the top well mm-hmm. he was probably at the top at that point too and uh, one thing you can honestly say is Mabel Normand is really the only person that worked with Chaplin that she was on par with him as far as stardom was concerned. Because in 1914, Mabel was just as big as Chaplin. They were, yeah. they were even, you know, and obviously later on, I can't think of anyone else that worked with Chaplin who you could say was at that point point in time when they were working together was on the same level of stardom. No. Uh, I was wondering, um, when exactly did Mac and Mabel meet, and how did their professional relationship turn into a more personal relationship? Um, well, they met, as everybody knows, it, as it said, is at the, at the uh, Griffith uh, studio as extras, and Mac was there, and I think it was probably... Uh, I wouldn't call it love at first sight, but they certainly noticed each other and um, teasing one another and that sort of thing. So I think this it was is an when Mac. This is when Mac. Just so people listening can can keep up with us. This is when Mac yeah. said it was an apprentice with D. W. Griffith. Yes, he was a character actor. You know, he wasn't. Um, he. I mean, 
Griffith knew him and, and liked uh, liked him, but he wasn't on the same wavelength with, with Mac, because Mac, uh, as you know, Griffith was very serious about everything that he did. Was that um, at Biograph? And, yes, yeah. and Vitagraph, too, I think it was. Uh, but he was, it was Griffith first, and then um, they went on from there, but uh, Mac and Mabel had a, had a, a chemistry, um, just at their meeting, I think. Um, oh, and then, uh, I mean, because they didn't initially work together. Um, uh, you know, they were both doing different things and she did Scores Love and some other uh, uh, things. And, and she wasn't a, a number one person at, at his, uh, at Griffith's studio. But um, he, he did, Griffith did see talent in her uh, as he did in Mac, but it wasn't what he, what he wanted. He, you know, he had these great epics and things that, that were yeah. to come forward where Mac and, uh, certainly didn't think of epics. He was <laughs> thinking of, um, as he says, how did he want to make the world laugh, which they hadn't been doing in the early uh, films. Was this in New York or was in California? Yes, Brooklyn. No, oh, no, this okay. was in Brooklyn. And, and what happened, Mac actually left and went out ahead of time, uh, you know, not ahead of time, but he went out to California first and he had, uh, in there communicating to one another, he said to Mabel, you know, I w would like you to come, but she couldn't get away uh, just because of family things and situation and also working because her family needed the money at the time. Um, and she was afraid to, to make that step. But Mac mm -hmm. kept in touch with her and then eventually he did get her to, you know, convince her to come. And once they were there, it was magic, you know, between the two. And they did have, I believe they did have a, a you know, very close relationship. Um, I mean, I don't know. M Mabel doesn't write in her diaries that she had, you know, say a sexual experience with him but it sounded to me pretty much in between the lines like they possibly probably did um but that Mac, she found mac very difficult because he wasn't very clean and he was uh, oh it was all sorts of little personal things um and he was quite not abusive to her but a bit gruff you know and and, and tough but um now, i won't send you flowers right yes I won't, I won't, <laughs> that's right exactly were they ever engaged to be married Yes, yes, and they were to be story. married. When I went out there in 74 and met Minta Arbuckle, um, she confirmed the whole, what the oh, family's... Uh, just a side note about her. Just I read an interview she did, and she did yeah. not have anything nice to say about Charlie, and some of it was, like, pretty brutal. I mean, as far as she was talking about he was dirty, you know, it was just... Anyway, I digress. I'm sorry, Stephen. Continue. <laughs> no, no. I'm. I, 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 I'm. Well, I'm afraid I probably planted that by saying about Mac. But, um, <laughs> but uh, no. She was a very opinionated lady, even in old age. When I, I had a, yes, a, an right. afternoon with her, and everything. but, but the, uh, the, the point is, yes, they were engaged to be married. Mabel even had an engagement ring, which she actually kept, and my grandmother used to wear it. Um, and a uh, problem that occurred was that. Mac was also messing about with someone called Mary Bush, who was yes, an actress. I well, I wouldn't say messing. They weren't having they weren't having an affair, but unfortunately, they were in a very close position when uh, Mabel discovered them together, and uh, there was a an upheaval, a, a little bit of an argument, and May Bush struck Mabel, and Mabel was injured, and then Mabel went back. Uh, home and that was it. it was over with um, and our family Mabel's mother and father and my grandfather and his sister uh, had all been out there that was in July 1914 I think it was um, and uh, that was the end of it because my uh, grandparents met Mac's mother Mrs. Sennett who was quite a lady um, uh, <laughs> she was a Mac in, in female clothing uh, no, I'm sorry but um she was a strong lady, and uh, and she loved Mabel, and uh, Mac knew that, and uh, he he was a mama's boy in in a sense, um, but sadly that was the end, and then but Mac to give him his due, you know tried to keep um, relationship and keep going, and eventually they became friends, but um, more formal than than warmth, because uh, as you know she went back to work 
for him in 23, I think it was, or 22, after the William Desmond Taylor problem, uh, and, and during it, because she was doing the Susanna. Um, and of course, and, and this is around the same time as the Arbuckle scandal. Yeah. So yes. all of those things were kind of all hitting home at once. Um, mm -hmm. And of course, Chaplin, too, had his issues with uh, Lita Gray and the pregnancy and the kid. So... And then Thomas Inc. mystery murder. I mean, yeah, there was a lot of things going on in those couple yeah. of years. It was a scandalous period for Hollywood. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Since we brought up uh, Arbuckle, uh, there's someone who we really haven't talked about yet as far as a collaborator with Mabel. Um, mm -hmm. I would even go as far to say her films with Arbuckle are more famous than her films with Chaplin. Yeah. yeah. You're absolutely right. And I think... that. In some t in some ways, you can see where the comedy sort of it had had uh, matured, advanced, and 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 they were like again. I use the word is uh, magic together because they their timing and everything was just fantastic, and they really did like each other. You know, they were really good friends, and um, uh, he was like a big brother, really. Um, and they were very close friends. His family uh, with Minter and everything. Minter loved Mabel too. So, and, and when he had his problems, Mabel stuck by him, and then hence they stuck by her as well. But um, on on camera, as you say, they made a, a number of films. I think she probably made more films with him than she did with Chaplin, um, quite possibly. And if only he hadn't had his problems, and it, things might have been a lot different. If someone yeah. had never seen. Uh, Mabel's films and you want to introduce them to some she did with Chaplin and some she did with Arbuckle and some she did with uh, even Max Sennett. What would be the ones that you would suggest? Mm -hmm. Well, her early films, I like, as I say, that with uh, would have been The, the Dash Through the Clouds, mm -hmm. um, uh, Tilly's Punctured Romance. I like Bonnie Oldfield's Race for Life. Um... Let me think. Mabel's married. I'd like to the whole thing. A Court in the Cabaret with Charlie was very good. Um, and so, Stephen, th those sorts. Um, yes. You know, um, you just mentioned Mabel's married life. And there's a scene that a lot of people talk about. And, and then that's where the debate comes up, whether, you know, how much of an influence that she did have on him. And there's a scene in Mabel's married life. Uh, she comes home. Her husband's at the bar drunk. She's like, you know, so done with him. She gets that sports dummy. But there's a part in, in the living room where she's mimicking, you know, him drinking, I've had enough. And then she kind of does the little chaplain walk. Like, she's actually, what it is is she's making fun of her husband. But when she yeah. does that walk, then people that have seen it say, you know, they could see in that one scene that she did have an influence on him because she was totally mimicking him. You know, it, it was, you know, pretty amazing and it was funny. I love yes. that movie with them. They are very funny in it together and very believable. The thing about Charlie and Mabel as a husband and wife, it was so believable because we all know couples like that. They're passionately in love, but they're fighting all the time. But there's still that it comes across. It's like really, to me, it's like really raw. Like, wow, they had such really great chemistry um, playing a um, husband and wife, you know, always fighting. But it's just I enjoy that. And that's something that upset me about the Attenborough film was that it made in the in the very few scenes where Marissa Tomei is playing Mabel, uh, I mean she looks great, obviously she she looks the part, but they make her out to be like they like her and Charlie did nothing but argue, when that couldn't be further from the truth. You know, sure they had their disagreements about things, and you know in the film they talk about uh, not a hot finish. That's that's what it was called later on. Mabel at the wheel. At the wheel. Mabel at the oh, wheel. Oh, yes. On the motorbike. Mm -hmm. Mm hmm You know, of course, legend has been built around that film as far as that's where Charlie started to, de to demand that he direct his own films because of the blow-up that occurred. But, I mean, if you wanted to just highlight a negative part of someone's relationship and put that down as the only thing that happened in the movie... You know, of course it's going to look bad. You know what What I think, too, is, you know, you think about the time that Charlie was born in Victorian London. I think, and you know, of course he had his time with Carno and, and Casey's Court and, and all that. I think Mabel was probably the first woman 
that he encountered that was telling him what to do. And I think it was just more than, than he could handle. You know what I'm saying? And I know at, at um, on the, the set of Mabel at the Wheel. Younger, you know, younger than him, too. Right. And when Charlie was being so obstinate and Mabel got upset and the men that were around the crew and, and cast wanted to kick, you know, kick his ass. I mean, you know what I'm saying? Because they, they all loved Mabel. You know, I, I really think their relationship wasn't. And I don't really think they did argue as, as it was put across. No, certainly not with nastiness. I think, you know, they may have had differences of opinion, but I don't think there was, um, like, you know, as they portrayed her as a bitch in the thing, excuse my expression, but, uh, they, you know, that, that wasn't her, she wasn't, what, she wasn't bitchy. That wasn't mm -hmm. her way. And I think, you know, she was used to brothers. She had two brothers and, and you know, she had to right. fight her own way with them. And I think that probably carried over. But, uh, you know, she listened to him. Mac probably had some influence in, in, in the sense of um, putting him down rather than Mabel putting him down. I think they, they, they put that, uh, that gets left out. You know, mm -hmm. actually, he was the power behind the throne and influence. I think Chaplin um, recognized Mabel had had skills and you know gifts and things but um he had an imagination and they played i really do think that if 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 it hadn't been max influence they may have done a bit bit, bit more but uh chaplin as you as we know wanted to, he had a brain and wanted to get on with things and he had other ideas and i he was an independent person wanting to be uh, on his own but um i think there was definitely a, a relationship of uh you know, a friendship and also uh, professional respect for one another. And um, I, I, I don't think he resented her directing him initially, but once he saw how, uh, you know, she, she could do what she did, he thought, well, I could do it better or I can do the same thing. And you can't blame him. I mean, as we say, she was one of the first women and the only woman to ever direct him or probably even to have had as much... Uh, influence on on what he was doing um of course and that course. wasn't to, that wasn't to happen again it was just mabel i have a question um yes. when senate discovered chaplin it was in a night in the english music hall right when that toured and yeah, yes in new york and i believe if i'm not mistaken it was 19 i think it was 1911 i think he may have actually seen charlie when Charlie first came to America, he was here from 1910 to early 1912 and then went back for five months and came back. I think that's the date, but I know it definitely was New York that Max saw um, A Night in the English Music Hall. And my, my question was going to be, was Mabel with him at that time? Were they were they both there? No, uh, he saw him first and then he told Mabel about him and then she uh, went and, and uh. saw him. Uh, but they they didn't go. I mean, this is a, like an historical uh, question, which um, it it depends on who's found the information, how they want to slant it. But in reality, no, they weren't together. But he saw him, and then wanted Mabel to uh, see him because it was known. You know, he was a bill on that billing of that um, right. show, I believe, the show. So um, and and you know, she did think he was talented. But to be quite honest, at that point um if it was mac thought he could work that it was mac that found him really not mabel uh, but mabel agreed and and could see it too but it really credit goes to mac really for that mm -hmm. and of course at the time they thought he was much older than uh he was when he showed up at senate because <laughs> yeah. it's funny to think yes. that he, he may never have even been hired if if senate honestly thought he was 20 23 24 years old at that time that's right. I just said Mabel was young, too, and she had loads of talent. Yeah, well, at the time, though, as far as he was looking for a Ford Sterling replacement. That's true. That's true. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Mabel had the pretty face, so, of course, he wanted her to be a little younger than everybody else. But as far as the guys went at that time, I don't think there was... They were all older. Yeah, they were all older, and they all looked older, too, with their mustaches and everything. Yeah. There was recently um, a Dunkin' Donuts commercial couple of years ago that came out have you seen that that looks like the actress that looks just like mabel in it i heard about this but um quite honestly they're very naughty because we have the rights to any time they use uh, mabel's um 
face or film, you know, her, her person uh, on a film or even from a film that's actually her um, being used in a commercial. They don't have a right to use. Oh, use oh, oh, that. no. Oh, it wasn't her. It was his, it was an actress that looked like oh. her. Oh, I see. Excuse me, because it oh, was a commercial okay. that uh, that it was about some kind of frozen peas or something, and she was on the railway track. And, and anyway, but that, oh. that that worked itself out. But um, no, I I have heard of this. Uh, there was something I think someone told me it was on YouTube or something, and um, uh, I, I'm aware of her, but I, I never heard anything more of it or, or what happened to okay. her. Or, well, well, I'll send you the the YouTube link. Uh, but the funny thing was, is when that commercial came out, there were all these people sending her emails saying you should play Mabel Normand if they make a biopic about her. Mm. And uh, well, I'm, I, I mean, sometimes I mean, as a matter of fact, at the moment in this Mac and Mabel that's happening, the girl is not exactly what Mabel looked like. I mean, she's got a diff- definitely a different facial appearance. They didn't hire her because of her looking like Mabel. That's unfortunate because Mabel, the way Mabel looked is so much a part of her. You know what I'm saying? That, that you know, she had that beautiful face and, and those liquid brown eyes. And that's why in the movie Chaplin, Marissa Torme looks nothing like Mabel. She's thinner and, you know, she's got the blonde hair, you know. Tall. Right. I mean, if they would have gotten a woman that was shorter and, and had the same sort of face and the dark hair and the big eyes and more of a, a voluptuous, well, not voluptuous, but more curvaceous figure, that would have, you know, been Mabel. I mean, I would say with, with looks, th- you know, someone hearing as her, I mean, they made, uh, um, I think it, it would be important to have someone, if they going to make a film about her, Mabel, then I really do think they should look for someone who looks like her, or at least put a wig on her and, and you know, uh, highlight the make, makeup and things. Because um, the way, the reason I play with this is because that people don't remember Mabel. Um, most everyone would have to look it up and see who is, who is this Mabel Norman, you know. Um, and uh, as a, in the theater I've been to, to Chester, people sitting behind me and in front of me, excuse me, that I could hear were when because actually in the uh, in the uh, program they put a picture of the, the real Mabel, and uh, and Mac, but the, but the real person who they the girl lady who they have playing Mabel doesn't doesn't look like it. So my, my point is if they hadn't this is who that's Michael Ball and uh, mm. Mm. this girl. Um, people were saying well she doesn't look anything like that real Mabel you know and I, and I would have to agree that, but in a film I think it would be important it would be something I think they should really do. Um, because, I mean, Richard say, Attenborough went out of his way to make sure that Robert Downey look, Jr. looked like Charlie Chaplin. Exactly. I mean, to I, be quite honest, he's quite shocked when I touch it. Because it is the thing that for years they've never known that there's been, you know, any family of Mabel Mom, or just certainly no one ever spoke out. But now they know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I think with the secondary characters in the movie Chaplin, they weren't too concerned about how exactly how they look. They were more concerned about star quality. Marissa Tomei was a huge star at that time. So mm-hmm. like they wanted her part of the film, as well as Kevin Klein and Anthony Hopkins, et cetera, et cetera. So, and I think this, is, this could be disagreeable and arguable to some, but... I think that the actors in the film Chaplin captured the essence of the characters they were playing, of the real people they were playing, so mm-hmm. that you could dismiss they don't look exactly like them. Dan Aykroyd, I thought, did pretty well. And I like that they chose Dan Aykroyd for Mac because both of them were from Canada. Hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's true, Yeah. So I like that they chose Dan Aykroyd. Well, well, what I was going to say about Marissa Tomei was, is it not necessarily, because even if that situation had occurred, uh, which of course it did during Mabel at the Wheel, but when that's all you show of one person in a movie, that's the, oh, the only editing scene. editing was terrible. And then you don't show any of the good things. It just puts a negative light on her. Yeah. Y- you know, I mean, I mean, if they made the Chaplin movie and all they showed was him in court arguing about that, the Joan, uh, Joan Barry, the Joan Barry baby, and that was the only part of the movie you saw with Chaplin. That would make you think he was a, just a terrible person. So it's all the way the film was was edited. And I, yeah. I was honestly, I'd love to see 
the four hour version to see if there was any more Mabel in it. Right. And that's why someday we, we have to talk to Dan Kamen more extensively because he was behind the scenes. He did tell us about that three minute montage between Charlie and the, the actress that, that played Edna. So I'm sure there has to be more scenes that were, that were shot with Charlie at Keystone with Mabel and, and, and Mac. Of course. I think probably uh, Lord Attenborough was really wanting to make sure that the film was about Chaplin and not to do with the um, elements of Mabel um, so much. But, you know, she was a principal person in the beginning of his career, so he I don't think he could have left her out. He might have been able to, but um, then we wouldn't have had a clear picture of why he, he um, went his separate ways from Mac and Mabel. I but. I think like uh, with Charlie's autobiography, uh, he was really criticized because he left so many people out. Mm. But to me, though, so that when he mentioned somebody, it really must have meant something to him. I mean, he, he wrote lovingly about Edna Proviance. You know, I mean, uh, he gave Max Sennett his due. He gave Mabel. So it, it almost seems like the fact that he mentioned these people is very significant because there's so many people... I don't know why he, he left them out. I mean, only he knows, but it just seems to have more of a significance for me that, that he, you know, he mentioned them. Yes. How so close I, were uh, Edna and Mabel? I was just going to ask that question, Nigel. <laughs> <laughs> they were partners in crime. They were yes. very, very friendly. <laughs> Unfortunately for both of them, they were the same sort of year and um, they sort of had the antics and they, they both... I'm, I'm afraid to, but just to say, they both like their gin, and they went yes. together and drink their gin. God knows what was going to happen next. It was probably a little bit extra scandalous because actually in the 1920s, uh, it was prohibition. So, mm -hmm. you know, people weren't supposed to be drinking. So I don't know if that added to it. A lot of people did, though. Oh, yes. Well, a lot of people do drugs, too. But, yeah. Has there been any recent talks of making a Mabel Norman uh biography movie or even, or even a mac and mabel film adaptation uh at the moment um well first of all i i've at different times i get um here that if there's someone talking about making a movie about it some have made these documentaries and uh on their own you know independent documentaries uh about her um and uh you know, i haven't really felt always that they did, did the right thing toward Mabel because um, they always have most to do with the scandal of the William Day and Taylor thing. The, always there is there is one there was one on the E network and and I think in the early 90s they had this um, series called Mysteries and Scandals they did one on Charlie they did one on Roscoe Arbuckle and they did one on Mabel but listening to it, it's just kind of like nobody went and did any new investigation. It was kind of like they just pulled stuff from stuff that was printed. And actually, well, uh, this and series put all on the three head. of them in a really bad light. Yeah, I mean, one about Mabel I watched, and I actually I think I wrote a little review of it in, in the thing. But um, people, it really gets me cross because there are people who, I've been doing this 50 years now. I've been in with my aunts looking up things and doing and research and talking. I actually spoke to people who knew her and, and corresponded with people who knew her. Um, but these people have had no connection with anybody. Uh, they just read books that other people have written and then they write their thoughts or their uh, imagination about whatever they had someplace else and then they exaggerate it. And, uh, you know, so the uh, saga goes on. Um, and there's never anything new. I mean, if you listen to what they say, it's the same old thing. And they sit there with this um, arrogant... Um, right, correct, uh, you correct. Know, ability to, to come across as if they are authorities. And they even call themselves historians. Historical, right. Yeah, historians. And, you know, I, I'm shouting at the television myself listening to this, and I'm thinking, oh, my God. And But no one has ever... Can I just say, I'm on Internet... And I have I don't hear from any of these people. No one ever gets in touch with me to ask me. And I've got Mabel's diaries. I have her books. I've got her notebooks. Uh, but they don't want to know the truth. They just want to continue on with this nonsense. Uh, and it, 
I'm sorry to sorry, I sound like I have an axe to grind, but I feel... No, it's completely fair, because, uh, you know, if you have someone, especially a relative, that you feel people are talking wrongly about, you're going to want to... Yeah. yeah, you're going to want to defend them. Are there any misconceptions as far as Mabel you'd like to iron out as being incorrect that may have been persisting for years as being accurate information? Yes. Yes, Nigel, thank you uh, for that and for the opportunity to answer that question. I, I, I'm afraid I have to say it's the accusations that she was a drug addict and that she was taking heroin and uh, 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 cocaine. Um, I, she had a problem drinking. She worked from 1911 until 1926, um, albeit she did have time off when she was uh, ill, when she got hit in the head by um, uh, May Bush. And then she uh, had a couple of other things that happened to her. But she basically, if you look at her record, she was working straight through, uh, even in her time with Goldwyn. Um, her problem was she overworked. Uh, and she had these different problems that came across with her, her relationship with Mac and then her time with Goldwyn, which also was another little bit of an affair. Uh, and so she took to drink. She didn't take to drugs because she showed up for work every day. Mm -hmm. um, and when she did become quite ill and uh, working for Roach in 26, then she had just made a sound recording test for William Morris Agency. Wow. And she, wow. was ex she was accepted to make talking pictures, but she then was struck down with her tuberculosis, which um, was what she was, what, what she suffered for the, the next four years. Um, and it got worse and worse. And in those days, there were no antibiotics. Right. There was nothing. I did, I did a, a few days ago, I did a, a post on my blog about, um, it was actually, it was Charlie Chaplin and this in he was a friend of this ambassador to Peru. His name was uh, Moore. But anyway, um, it talked about how he had tuberculosis and he stayed at Charlie's for a little while and then he went into a hospital. And as I was uh, researching it, he had uh, tuberculosis and he died um, February 17th of 1930. And all of a sudden I'm thinking, Mabel died, you know, a few days after that. And then, you know, like I'm, I'm always trying to do more research and stuff. So then I started reading about TB. And apparently it was a great killer. It was like 70,000 people a year were dying from it. Then when I started reading about it, I really, I was like, oh, that sounds like such a horrible illness. And I was like, for Mabel to have suffered like that, you know, for the last few years of, uh, of her life, you know. But it was, it wasn't an uncommon uh, disease. It was just, they, they didn't have the antibiotics and it was just fatal and no, really it, sad. Well, I mean, her brother... Ralph died when he was 16 uh, of tuberculosis. Mabel herself had had tuberculosis as a, uh, as a teenager just before. Uh, that was why she wasn't working, why she went to go to Butterick's eventually to, to her first job. Mm -hmm. uh, and her mother kept her at home. Um, and she was fortunate she got over it, uh, you know, was, but never was totally healed. And so, um, I mean, it, she she was in and out of sanitarium as well. It, in those days, what what they called sanitariums, uh, you know, nursing homes, really, for it to rest and uh, take care of herself, and then and she was at home as well. But um, is coughing up blood? You know, she she was when making her film, she was coughing and having uh, problems and running low fevers and all oh. the things that go along with it. But um, they gave her something called phenobarbital, which uh, was common to 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 get uh people who who had that so they wouldn't be coughing because you couldn't be coughing and sputtering all over the place right, when she's being right. filmed mm -hmm. uh, and so i would say probably you know if anything she may have taken more of that than she at times should have only because it it stopped the cough you know and stopped the bleeding um the hemorrhaging but uh then it just overtook her and she was just too ill so uh as you say, if people knew more about what tuberculosis was, it probably be, would be uh, maybe more would excuse or believe that she she really was a sick woman. Um, right. And and as you said, 
it was common. I mean, it wasn't on. But I, if she had taken as many drugs as these people claim, um, heroin and cocaine. She'd have died. Yes. I mean, at that pace. But she did drink. I mean, one time when she was in uh, Washington, she, uh, I think it was President Wilson or uh, one of the presidents anyway, their wife it was a, um, a charity thing and Mabel was on broad stage and someone called out from the audience, Mabel, you brought the sunshine from California, but how about uh, the moonshine too? So, uh, you know, and she did, did like drinking. I mean, Sherry Netherland Hotel in New York, she was often sitting uh, with friends and things and just having her little, little uh, flask of uh, gin. Stephen, going back to what you said about her doing a, um, a test for the talkies, I'm going to guess that that audio does not exist anymore. No, I, I, my grandmother had told me that my grandfather had given it to the, uh, you know, he received all these things that came from Hollywood, all of Mabel's trunks and bags and things and going through it all. They found that. And there was a letter from the William Morris agency uh, that, you know, accepted her for, for talking films. Um, Anyone has ever asked me, I've always said, well, my grandfather gave it to the National, to the uh, Smithsonian Institute in Washington. Oh. And during these years, um, it's been lost or misplaced or whatever. Um, I don't know what happened to it, but it's, it is been, has been misplaced or lost there. And they, ha they claim they have no record of it, but um, I think it's easy to have things disappear or whatever in, in such large quantities you know when you have, they collect so many things so I'm, I'm hoping it will turn up um at some point has but anybody ever was, uh, right i'm sorry uh, um you were about to mention her voice that's what i was going to ask yes, well, you about my aunt, aunt glad was sort of like a lauren bacall voice uh, a little deeper if you know what i mean mm -hmm. um but not gruff and and um it it wasn't as time went on, uh, a distinctly New York accent, Brooklyn right. type thing. Um, so she had a, a nice voice. It would have been fine for for, the, for most pictures um, with sound. And uh, and it, my own self, listening to my Aunt Gladys, what she sounded like, who was Mabel's sister, I would agree with what, what she said. Um, I think Mabel would have had a pleasant voice. Uh, and, you know, she did take elocution lessons and she took her French lessons and all that, trying to improve herself. So uh, I, I'm really sad that we don't have that uh, wax disc uh, of her voice. Because well, they you, were very common. You never know, because it was only a couple of years ago that people thought Charlie Chaplin was confused when he said he was a Keystone cop and that a film like that never existed. And then in 2011, a thief catcher pops up and it proves that uh, Charlie did perform as a Keystone cop, you know, almost a hundred years later, this film pops back up. So you mm -hmm. never know, never say never until, uh, until you can be a hundred percent sure. Cause no matter somewhere in the world, there could be that, that audio somewhere. You never know. I, I for one would love to hear uh, what Mabel sounded like. And that actually brings me to another question. It's kind of a hypothetical one. Um, let's say that Mabel never did get sick. Let's say the 20s were a little kinder to Mabel. Uh, obviously, she still made her, her feature films with Goldwyn. But um, had she lived into the 30s and 40s, what would be your guess as to what she would have done? I was okay. just reading, um, there's a movie from 1927 called The Passion of, um, I think it's Passion of John. It's, it's a French movie. And um, oh, yeah. that movie was considered lost for years. And they found a copy in an in an asylum in, in Oslo, Norway. So hmm. anything's possible. I was just reading that yes. today. So anything's possible that they, they might find that Mabel's voice out there. Mm -hmm. As far as the, these uh, films being found, they found in Russia, Mabel's films, um, you know, up until the revolution. And um, they were actually collected by the the royal family who wow. the little boy who was ill oh, he, wow. the little, uh, Alexei? little Alexander, Alexei, yes okay. he used to watch them uh, for uh, you know because he was ill in bed and they right. had these yeah, films yeah, for him to watch yeah. right. oh, wow, yes, that's... So th 
they've got the co- they have copies i think uh, or that they actually had the films and they've got them in the um, museum there the heritage i believe is where, oh, where it is okay. anyway but that they're just a little bit of trivia for you but uh, <laughs> interesting um, trivia that's really it, cool but what i think would have happened to mabel later on if she had lived would be um just going along with say she had the contract with hal roach i mean it it might have been different if she had lived and had had good health she may have been with Goldwyn still or whatever but or even further on than that but she was with Roach and in some of her earlier films as I was saying Stan Laurel and Oliver Hardy were in uh, her her uh, her films different different times um, and the nickel hopper is the one that I had mentioned where Oliver Hardy's playing drums as Mabel's dancing in a in a dance scene, mm. and uh, Boris Karloff is hopping onto the train uh, or to a streetcar, and he made his debut in, in, in a Mabel film. So a lot of these uh, people who succeeded later on started out with her, um, Donald Crisp and others. But the point is, I think she probably would have stayed on with Roach, um, and you know, Mae Bush did very well with her comedy i think she would have gone on to to do talking films and uh, and comedy i think she probably would have tried to go into uh, try to get herself set in something more serious uh, a role um but i'm i'm not too sure if that would have worked but um, i think she would have been a comedian you know still have kept her comic ways about i mean there was some women who were quite funny in the 30s in the films. I'm afraid I can't remember the names, but uh, there was a lot in the Fred Astaire films. Thelma Todd was one who was very yes, funny. That's, yeah. Exactly. And I, I could see Mabel doing that sort of thing. Yeah. I mean, mm-hmm. She then would have been in her 40s. She uh, probably would have maybe even gone into directing or pro- put some of her money into a production company or maybe worked with Mary Pickford. Uh, you know, I, I just don't know. I, I I think she would want to have kept working if she were well. Do you think she would have guest starred on any television shows? Oh, oh yes, yes, she would. Have, she would have come on uh, if she had lived that long. <laughs> she would have done her guest guest spots. I think she uh, would have loved that. Um, yes, and I think people would have liked to have had her too. On on this. there's a, there's a man in New York called Joe Franklin who has yeah, I since him. passed away, and and he used to show all of her films. Um, and you know, if you like, Carol Burnett remembers who she was, and uh, there would have been in, in the early fifties. Groucho Marx was around, and there were still people uh, who who had these um, programs, and I'm sure she would have did. Um, but I know one thing: I really wish I could have known her and been with her. <laughs> mm-hmm. Do you think she would have worked with Chaplin again in the thirties and forties? If because Charlie had oh, a way I- of bringing people back that he enjoyed working with. Uh, Chester Conklin, and of course, um, the man from City Lights, uh, his Hank name is me, Hank Mann from the Keystone and Buster era. Keaton, Buster Keaton, too. I mean, I, I think, you know, they, they all knew each other intimately, and they all did try to help one another. Um, and I think, yeah, I think, you know, there was a, there was a relationship that between her and Chaplin that wasn't wasn't broken um, and as I said to you earlier that you know my great grandmother used uh, asked him to be a pallbearer and, and even Max Sennett but I mean Sennett screwed so many people up and made so many mistakes himself that he was sort of blackballed by you know, the community it's funny Stephen because there are some people that think if Mabel would have stayed you know this is some people think if Mabel would have stayed with Mac then she wouldn't have had this tragic life, but it sounds like he was a mess too. Oh, he was. Yeah. I mean, she would have. Uh, she would have been very unhappy. I don't think the mar- if they had got married, I don't think it would have worked really. Um, yeah, I mean, if he's fooling around the day before the wedding, or you know, yeah. close to it, then yeah, that's that's an no, indicator. I mean, she, she had, uh, you know, there were people like Jones who was well um, educated and, and very clever who was you know, one of the Senate's directors and um, he worked with Mabel. Mabel was attracted to smart people and she liked people who had intelligence and were, you know, were um, polished and I think those are the kind of people she would have found herself more and more involved with and therefore uh, with that sort of influence I think she would have, would have done much better I mean, uh, you know, would have, would have improved in her quality of 
films as well. Um, you, you know, you mentioned uh, the French films. Well, Pathé was interested in her as well. There was a, another oh. uh, mm. avenue that she was um, exploring just before she got very sick. A few okay. years ago, uh, the what was it? The National Film Registry. They added the Mabel film "One in a Closet" to the National oh, yes. Film Registry. Is that the only film the, of Mabel's that we know of so far that's been added to something like that? Uh, yes, that's the that uh, officially, officially. But they have found um, an, some other films of hers, and I think there's more than one uh, in New Zealand, which. Um, they were interested to place uh, there, but um, you know it's it's sort of an honor for that to happen. So and it has to be quite good. Um, but but and the condition of the film as well. But um, I haven't heard any more on that as a, a, at the moment. But um, when exactly did Mabel receive a uh, star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame? Well, to be honest, she was one of the very first mm. people, and that mm. was. I I think in the late sixties, or, or I, you know, to be honest, I don't, I, I can't remember exactly the date that they started this, but in those days, it was um, they paid for it and they put them, put each one in, you know, put put the star in, um, and and did the upkeep on it. Um, but she's one of the first. I, I can't remember how many people. Is it fifteen hundred people? But nowadays, if you were to have one, you they actually pay for it. It's thirty thousand dollars, I think, to have a star put in. Mm -hmm. They've been get so she was Edna for vines to get um, a star because she doesn't have one. Right. Oh, but yet I, Kim Kardashian does. Please. Yeah. yeah. Please. Well, I mean, there's a, a, to be these people who have them. I I believe because I don't know a whole lot about them, but um, I did get correspondence in the last year. Of, about the star, and because I, I saw it and thought it was in poor condition, mm -hmm. and I felt I should do something about that. But a lot um, of them are. Uh, yes. People think of the Hollywood Walk of Fame as being this glamorous thing, but it's really fallen into disrepair. They, they a lot of the stars are cracked, um, or they have graffiti on them, or they're just dirty. And I hope at some point they do a restoration campaign because uh, that's not how it should be. That, I don't think that's respectful to the. To the people on the stars, right. that's right. And I'm sure I, I, if Mabel had had lived longer, she probably would have had her her hands imprinted uh, in Grauman's Chinese Theater, which I think now is the TLC or TCL uh -huh. Theater. Well, Sid Grauman was a great friend of hers, and they she used to go to dinner parties with them. I have some letters and things from from them, and I'm definitely she would have been chosen or asked to to do that, but. Uh, um, Again, she was just too sick, too ill. She couldn't couldn't get right. out. I mm -hmm. mean, I think her last public appearance was in 1926 at some opening of a film. And there's actually a, a little newsreel of it, of her and um, uh, Hitchcock, Raymond Hitch, Hitchcock. Okay. Is, and and uh, uh, one she had met, um, Lou Cody, uh, showing them me and a limousine to them and very frail, but she's basically with... One more question I had. Obviously, you've done a lot of uh, research on on Mabel. Uh, was there anything that that you discovered that really surprised you, as far as uh, when you were researching her, something that you didn't know before that that really surprised you, or was different than how you originally thought it to be? Yes, uh, I mean this is is quite a personal thing because I I had no idea that she was supporting so many uh, children's charities and, and orphanages, um, and it, in Europe as well, sending quite a bit of money. And the only reason I know this is because I've had found uh, letters of thanks from various convents and orphanages, uh, some in Italy, some in France, and and here too in America. Uh, well, I'm not in America at the moment, but in America. Um, and she, she um, had a, a great respect for women who were not married but had children. Um, and that, I think, a copy of a, a, a note that she'd started to write of concern about that. Um, I think she probably would have been a woman, uh, you know, very much interested in women's rights and that sort of thing, and would have become quite um, active in in seeing that women were were recognised. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I was also surprised that. She was quite eloquent in her writing, um, and she, for someone who wasn't 
formally educated up and only through grade school to eventually have developed the um, penmanship that she had and also her vocabulary and her list of books uh, that were in her library uh, that she actually read and even sometimes talks about them in her, her own personal mm -hmm. diaries. Uh, so I was surprised, you know, uh, when I say surprised, it was just sort of very touching. I felt sad, you know, I felt, oh, poor Aunt Mabel, I wish, you know, she she could have um, had been able to let this kind of information be known to the public because people would have thought a lot differently of her, I think, um, that she actually was a concerned person and uh, in society and uh, was, was trying to do better not just for some, but for others too. And that's something I wanted to make sure to, to hammer into this, because, you know, when you hear about Mabel, it's just, you hear so many negative, the, you know, the murder and the drugs and, and this, that, and the other, but there's so many great things about her, not only being a, a pioneering woman in comedy, in film in general, that always frustrated me when, when I would read articles and, and, and see documentaries about her. It would always just be negative, the negative things. And uh, I could see on my own research that there was a lot of positivity and a lot of things that she did, a lot of trailblazing uh, examples of, of her career that no one would ever really talk about. And as you said, Stephen, she seemed to be a very charitable person. And what I now admire about her is that she didn't like make it a big deal that she was very charitable and such a philanthropist that she was doing it out of the goodness of her heart, not because it was something to put in magazines. Mm -hmm. A lot of her did. Yeah, we only went to the family because uh, all the papers and things were sent back to her family. At, at first, my Mabel's mother, her great, her mother, my great grandmother, uh, moved into Mabel's home and stayed out there for a year. Years, so, and then she became ill and actually died in Hollywood too. But the point is, um, you know, as the family went through things and we're reading these things, it was like disbelief that she was doing so much and had done so much. Mm -hmm. um, you know what you seems know, to be ever saying anything out loud about it. You know what seems to be fortunate is that even, I mean, technically she was legally married to this Lou Cody, and sometimes mm -hmm. the law, unless unless Mabel sp specified what was going to happen to her stuff. A lot of times it would go to, you know, the husband. And you have to imagine if that would have been the case, if they would have handed this stuff over, you know, people wouldn't know yeah. the stuff that you're revealing. Well, Mabel's will was, 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 she did make a will just you know, a few years before she passed away. Oh, and, good, uh, good. Well, she was married to, to him. Mm -hmm. And she left him the sum of $1. Oh. Um, and then uh, her mother was Executrix, and he was uh, as her husband. Um, he had that right. So, but he didn't receive anything and didn't take anything uh, from from the family. He just did his legal part in it, and then he was inherited by his mother, and then my grandfather and his sister when the passed away. Where can we find more about you? Uh, I know you have a Tumblr page. Anne actually might know more about this than I do. You have well, a Tumblr page. Uh, you, you have a, a, a Facebook. I've got Facebook, Tumblr, and I have twi Twitter now. I've done mm -hmm. that. And um, I have a, a site, an internet. If you, you look at my Facebook, it will give you my... Uh, it's a free webs one that I worked. Uh, but, I mean, I'm, I've tried to um, on a upgrade. But it's just, as you know, I have, I have uh, not very great health at times, and I, I find it all too much. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I mean, I, I don't know whether I've, you know, but I do suffer with bipolar, which is not uh, it's something to live with. The family, the Normans have all had depression, so it's it's something inherited they get they gather. So. Oh, I see. You know, uh, I didn't but, know that. No, we will certainly post uh, all the links to your pages on our page. Oh. So people that listen Thank to you. this can can uh, can really look and see what you've done as far as as spreading information about Mabel. I, I haven't looked in a while. Do you share your items from her that you that you own? The I, pic well, pic pictures the, of them online and such. Oh yes, there's all sorts of things I've I've put on it. There's also a a, col a, a column called uh, "Wished on Mabel." Um, 
West John Mabel Normand and Company, which is a uh, a site that um, they it's just all Mabel Normand, and occasionally I'll put things onto that on as well. I do, you know, photographs and sometimes letters, and uh, I don't put put a whole lot out there because it's said people excuse me make copies and keep them and then pretend it's theirs and it isn't i see uh, i haven't mastered doing watermarks yet <laughs> still working on that that's okay well Stephen, we really really appreciate you coming on the show and um uh -huh. ann and sarah do you have any more questions for him that yeah uh, i'm just curious um are you originally from england i mean is that where you were born no Okay. No, no, no. You kind of have that born... sophisticated accent. <laughs> I have uh, actually. I, I was born on uh, Staten Island and um, was brought up down near in St. George, near Wells Falls, in the house that they lived in. My grandmother and I had a, a flat a street, um, and you could the house still. But because my grandfather hung himself in the basement, I moved out of the house and didn't want anything to do with it. Um, but I was. Born there, brought up, went to school, um, and then from there went into the army and then went to university in Texas. And uh, it was in 1971 that I got involved with the Mac and Mabel thing. And then in 1980, I moved uh, through my work, working for Michael Stewart, who wrote the book of Mac and Mabel, uh, to, to Europe, to France. And, and uh, worked for him there in London uh, with Barnum and other things. And then I felt I had a calling to, uh, to the church, which I then became a priest in the, um, I was ordained and became mm. a priest in the Church of England. So I've been here in England since 1981, um, but I go back and forth. My mum passed away. My uh, dad has got Alzheimer's. So I go back and forth to see him, um, but uh, this is my home. I've worked and now I'm retired here, so I even get my British The reason pension. I thought is some of the words you use, I know, like, you know, you, you just said mom. That's something that they use for mom. And you said you went to university where no normally here we would say, you know, you went to um, a university. So that's why I ah. started wondering if, if you actually were born and bred in, um, in England. No, well, my grandmother, just to say, she spoke with a English Irish accent, so I, mm -hmm. I was brought up by her and um, spent a lot of time with her. So, but the, right. but the family family basically we're, we're New Yorkers or we like to say Staten Islanders. <laughs> yeah, right. There's a difference. And you vacation yeah. in Florida, right? Uh, Melbourne. Well, yes, it was, it was it's a small little condo that with my parents, um, but both of them, as I've said, one my mum has passed on and then dad is not well, so my uh, uh, you know we use it just to have a couple of months in the winter away. My, my big plan is to go out to California and um, meet up with some of the people I've been keeping in touch with about Aunt Mabel mm -hmm. and then put together um, a little program about Mabel that I would go around with, with slides and things and photographs and, and talk about her. Uh, that would be I, fantastic. I would love to see that. I've done a little bit of it here and, and uh, with um, whenever they do a, um, a presentation of Mac and Mabel, you and speak to the cast and tell them about the person. Um, that always goes over quite well. Uh, this past week when I was down at the theater, they were, they were talking to me about that and trying to encourage me to do that. And the last thing is, I really do think I should do a book about her life myself rather than someone's doing it. Oh, definitely, definitely. Boy, I read it. I have one question, one last question. Um, what have you done with the costumes that your uh, grandmother had that belonged to Mabel? It's all still in um, things like that in a storage, a special storage place in New York. Um, but I have decided, because of all the different controversy and um, aggravation I get on the internet, um, I have decided that uh, it's either going to go to my university where I was or it's going to go out to the academy in California. But I, I find the academy not very, uh, I mean, they'd like it very much, I think, but I don't find them very friendly. Um, mm -hmm. no. So my point is, is when I pass away, everything will be made then public and people can, uh, you know, go through it and do as they, as they wish. But in my lifetime, I don't want to, I, I can't because I live in two different countries and it's just, too time-consuming and uh, also 
you know, I want to be in charge of it in the sense of making sure nothing happens to it and it isn't abused or gets Absolutely. stolen or whatever. Yeah. Of course. Um, you know about the Chaplin Museum that's supposedly opening up in his home in uh, Switzerland, right? Yes, I've heard of this. Yes, I have. I have. I haven't been invited to the opening, but yes, I have heard of it. We haven't either. It's okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I would even wonder if just, they would be they would be interested in some of that at some point because of the connection that Charlene Mabel had. I don't know how deep into his career they would want to go as far as that's considered, but if I was uh, running the Chaplin Museum there, I would certainly be interested in at least getting some something from Mabel to to put up in the in the museum. Yes, I, I again, I haven't. They haven't been very forthcoming to me whenever I've tried to get in touch with them. Uh, not recently. This is you know years back. So, it, for me, it's all been a struggle uphill. And people mm -hmm. who could have helped me, I think, had. And I've, I, I'm not cross with them, but I just feel I'm not ready to share what I have yet. Of course. Until it's the yeah. right right time. But I hear what you're saying, and it is a consideration. Um, but at the moment, I'm I'm wanting it all to go. Uh, to someone or some place that just is deserving and, and really would appreciate it. Thanks, Stephen, so much. Uh, you know, we really appreciate you coming on. We had some technical errors that I'm sure uh, will be obvious during some parts of the interview, but uh, we really enjoyed hearing your side of things, and, and you're somebody that we wanted to talk to for a long time, and we'd love to have you back at some point as well. Well, I, I would love to come back and I'll tell you what I'd like to sort out with you all on the on this program be to talk about the book that Betty Fussell wrote called uh, Mabel. Okay. Uh, that I was uh, that I was um, involved in. You probably know the book, um, but I'd like to sort out that with, with the real story of how that came out and I got taken. Mm -hmm. No, that's fine. Yeah, I actually I do own that book, but I don't think I ever got all the way through it. Unfortunately, Nigel, it's the only book that's been written specifically about Mabel, and unfortunately, um, she, this person who wrote the book, took all of my correspondence. This is why I'm I'm very careful now about what I do with anything of Mabel's, and well, if you look at your book, you'll see where I've been. My personal letters and things were quoted from and out of context, and 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 I was placed in a rather. Um, ridiculous point point of view and and looked at by her as uh, sort of a, a, an over-the-top eccentric so um, mm. there's two sides to every story but I, I won't take it up now with you but I would like to if you would like me to to explain that book at some point we would love that we would certainly love to have you back most certainly anytime thank you and and may I say to the three of you thank you so much um, for all that you do on 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 the uh, Facebook and um, you know for your own um, things that you're wishing for yourselves and how you work hard on on the programs that you do um, you know, I really appreciate it and you know you're special people too and I'm so glad there's people like you out there that um, are, 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 are respectful and kind of um, memories of the people who were have been pioneers in the past. So thank you You're very welcome, much. Steven. Thank but you. It, it sounds like if, a, if there's a book to be uh, written, you've got the homework assignment. Mm -hmm. I mean, you would be the perfect <laughs> person, the perfect person, the only person really. Uh, uh, well, I, <laughs> I'll, I'll be in touch with both, all of you as well to get your thoughts and opinions too. So, oh, wonderful. Um, uh, but, but, but thank you so much for, sure. for this opportunity today. And well, you know, you all have lovely voices. You come across on the radio, uh, the, program here very well so thank you um, you're yeah. doing the right thing <laughs> <laughs> okay then well i guess you, you want to get on your way now i this is one thing of the normans i do talk too much just like mabel <laughs> <laughs> if we find that record someday we'll be able to uh, to, to know to know that for sure <laughs> definitely <laughs> uh, we will talk to you, you soon all right steven okay. thank you so uh, much bye okay all right. so then bye bye now thank you bye bye well that's the show everyone thanks for listening if you have any questions for Stephen Norman, feel free to post them on our Facebook page. I'm going to start a thread that he will be a part of. The question will open up to this particular episode. What is your favorite Mabel Norman film that she made with Charlie Chaplin? Post that onto our Facebook page. And feel free to include pictures or video clips if you have them. So thanks for listening, and we will see you on the next episode of the Modern Times Podcast. Take care.